Hello everybody and welcome back to Advanced Maths. Today we are going through an entire IGCSE Maths Pass paper with full work solutions on screen for you. The paper we're doing is Specimen Paper 1 and it can be found and downloaded at advancedmaths.com. You can also find the math scheme there as well. And what I would really recommend you doing is to print the paper and the math scheme, have you got it yourself first, and then look at the work solutions on this video. However, if you prefer, you can just watch the video so that you understand the method for the entire past paper before you start. Check out advancedmaths.com for more past papers. They are completely free and can download them at any time. Without much further ado, let's start with question one. So it says Yoko flew on a plane from Tokyo to Sydney. The plane flew a distance of 7,800 kilometres. The flight time was 9 hours 45 minutes and work out the average speed of the plane in kilometres per hour. We are going to do speed equals distance divided by time here and we have to be careful that 9 hours 45 minutes is actually 9.75 hours. We're converting 45 minutes into uh, 0.75. Speed equals distance divided by time, and speed is 7,800, and the time is 9.75 hours, not 9.45. You can do that in calculator by doing 45 divided by 60, and that gives you 0 0.75. So 45 divided by 60, 45 minutes out of a full hour, is 0 0.75. And when we type this into our calculator, what do we get? You get 7,800 divided by 9.75 is 800 kilometers per hour, and that is indeed the final answer. That is the final answer, and we have done question one for three marks. Let's try question two. Penny, Angie, and James share some money in the ratio three to six to four. Angie gets uh, $28 more than James. Work out the amount of money that Penny gets. So you can see the ratio here, 3 to 6 to 4, and we know that Amjit gets $28 more than James. So we've got two more shares is $28 more. So we know that two, dollar, two shares is $28. Therefore, we can do 28 divided by 2 to get $14 is one share, and penny share is three shares. So we'll do 14 times 3, to get to $42. And that is indeed the final answer, $42 for three marks. Question three. A factory has 60 workers. The table shows information about the distances in kilometers the workers travel to the factory each day. Part A, we're asked to write the modal class. The modal class is the most common class, the most. And the most common class is the biggest frequency, which here is uh, 25 to 30 kilometers. Part B, it says work out an estimate for the mean distance traveled to the factory each day. And to do this, we're going to write the mean or the middle number of each class, 2.5, 7.5, 12.5, etc. And we'll start multiplying by the frequency. This is frequency tables, group frequency tables, if you're not familiar with this, you can watch my video on it. We multiply and we get this, then we add this entire column, and we add the entire frequency. And the mean is given by 1040 divided by 60, which on the calculator is 17 and one third. The average distance travelled is 17 and one third. Now, it says one of these workers is chosen at random. Write down the probability that this worker travels more than 20 kilometers to the factory each day. So if this worker travels more than 20 kilometers per day, it's between either the uh, one of the last two groups, either from 20 to 25 or from 25 to 30. So it's the last two groups we're interested in because they are the only people that travel more than 20 kilometers each day. And that means there's 14 and 18 people, that's 32 people. 32 out of 60. And we can just simplify that fraction to get 8 out of 15. And that's the probability that the worker travels more than 20 kilometers each day. That's question 3 for 7 marks. 
Question four. Nigel bought 12 boxes of melons. He paid $15 for each box. There were 12 melons in each box. Nigel sold three quarters of the melons for $1.60 each. He sold all the other melons at a reduced price. He made an overall profit of 15%. Work out how much Nigel sold each reduced price melon for. Okay, there's a lot of words in this question, and so we're going to work through it step by step. Start with each sentence and digest what each sentence has to say. Once you're happy with one sentence, move on to the next sentence. So, we know that Nigel saw, uh, bought 12 boxes of melons and he paid $15 for each box. So 12 times 15 gives us the total price he paid, $180. There were 12 melons in each box, so 12 melons times 12 boxes is 144 melons. Now, three quarters of the melons uh, he sold for $1.60 each. So three quarters of 144 is 108 melons. And we can multiply that by $1.60. And that means that uh, he made $172.80 from those three quarters of the melons, those 108 melons. All the other melons he sold at a reduced price. He made an overall profit of 15%. So we're going to start with 180 and we're going to times it by 1.15 to increase that by 15%. And that gets us $207, which he earned. So 1.15 comes from the multiplier to increase something by, one, uh, by 15%. And so uh, 207 minus $172.80 gives us $34.20. And this is the price that he must have sold all the other melons for. How many melons was that? Well, it was 144 minus 108, which is 36 melons. So, uh, we have $34.20, and we're going to divide that by 36 to find the cost of each of the remaining melons. And when we type that into a calculator, we get 34.2 divided by 36 is 0 0.95. Each of the reduced melons cost was sold for uh, $0.95. And that is the final answer for five marks. Question five, it says use a ruler and a compass uh, to construct the bisector of angle ABC you must show your construction lines. Okay, so this is an angle bisector, and we're going to use our ruler and compasses to construct this. So, our compass, we're going to take, and we're going to use that to draw an arc at the center B. And this will look like this, and what it does is it finds us two points on lines AB and BC that are equally equidistant from B. Now we're going to do the same again. I'm going to keep the distance on the compass the same each time. To draw one arc there, and you're going to draw another arc over here, like this. And each time we're centering the needle uh, on the exact intersection point of those arcs. And these two, this creates two points for us to connect, which will perfectly bisect our angle. So we take our ruler, like this, and we draw a line from B to the intersection of those two arcs, like this. And that is a perfect angle bisector uh, from, or of that angle for two marks. Done. Question six. It says, factorise fully. 18e cubed f plus 45e squared f to the power 4, and also solve x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals 0, showing clear algebraic working. Part A, and we're going to factorise this expression. 18 and 45 can both be divided by 9, so put 9 on the outside, 2 and 5 on the inside. e cubed and e squared can be both divided by e squared, let's put e squared on the outside, and e 
to make E cubed on the inside. F and F to the power 4 can both be divided by F, so put F on the outside, and F cubed on the final part of the expression to make F to the power 4. And that is the final answer. We have factorised the expression fully. Now part B, we're going to solve this, and we're going to solve it by factorising to show how we're working out. And so we're looking for, to factorise that a quadratic, and to do that we need to know two numbers that multiply to make minus 12 and add to make minus 4, and those two numbers are 2 and minus 6. So 2 times minus 6 is minus 12, 2 plus minus 6 is minus 4, and they are the numbers we're going to use. So we're going to write the expression like this, x plus 2, x minus 6, and when we solve this, to find when it's equal to 0, either x is minus 2 or x is 6. It's just the opposite of the numbers in the bracket. And that is full algebraic working to make it very clear to the examiner how you got the answer. That's question 6 for 5 marks. Question 7, it says calculate the length of PR. Give your answer correct to three significant figures. Okay, so we've got a right angle triangle here, and it seems obvious to me that we're going to use Sokia Toa. And here I'm going to uh, choose from either sin, cos, or tan. And to that, I'll label the lengths adjacent and hypotenuse. We want to find PR, that's the adjacent, and we're given the hypotenuse, which is 17.6. So which of sin, cos, and tan uh, connect adjacent and hypotenuse? It is ka. Uh, and so, we'll, to find the adjacent, we'll do cos times hypotenuse. And it looks like this. The adjacent is cos of 35 times the hypotenuse, which is cos of 35 times 17.6. On your calculator, is 14.417. But we'll round that to three significant figures. 14.4 centimetres is the correct answer for three marks. A nice, easy, circulatory question there for you. Question 8 says, in a sale, all normal prices are reduced by 15%. The normal price of a mixer is reduced by $22.5. Work out the normal price of the mixer. Okay, so we've got know that prices are reduced by 15% and the mixer is reduced by $22.5. And that says to me that 15% is the same as $22.5. Say, 15 equals 22.5. What we can do is we can divide by 15 to find 1%. So 1% is the same as $1.5. Do that on your calculator. And then to find the full price of the mixer, we're going to times by 100. The normal price is times by 100, and that gets us to $150. And that is the final answer. That's question 8 for 3 marks. Question 9. The table shows diameters in kilometres of 5 planets. Question A says, write 1.4 times 10 to the power of 5 as an ordinary number, and that is simply 140000. If you're struggling with that, you just move the decimal point 5 places to the right and add in some zeros to help. Part B. Which of these planets has the smallest diameter? Well, the easiest way to find is the one with the smallest power of 10. And Mars has the smallest power of 10, that's 10 to the power of 3. So Mars is the smallest diameter. And it says calculate the difference in kilometres between the diameters of Saturn and the diameter of Neptune. Give your answer in standard form. And the word difference here means subtract. So whenever in maths you see the word difference, it means subtract. We're going to do the diameter of Saturn minus the diameter of Neptune, which is going to be 1.2 times 10 to the power of 5 minus 5 times 10 to the power of 4, which is 70,000. But it says to give your answer in standard form, so you're going to convert that to be 7.0 times 10 to the power of 4. Good. Now it says the diameter of the moon is 3.5 times 10 to the power of 3 kilometres, and the diameter of the sun is 1.4 times 10 to the power of 6 kilometres. Calculate the ratio of the diameter of the moon to the diameter of the sun gives you an answer in the form 1 to n. So the, that's the key idea here where we want to make 1 be the number on the left hand side of the ratio. 
So, uh, we're going to write the ratio of the moon to the sun, and that is, as it says in the question, 3.5 times 10 to the 3 to 1.4 times 10 to the power 6. Now, you want to make it 1 on the left-hand side, so we're going to have to divide the left-hand side by 3.5 times 10 to the power 3. So, we'll also have to divide the right-hand side by 3.5 times 10 to the power 3. And on the calculator, we do 1.4 times 10 to the power 6 divided by 3.5 times 10 to the power 3, and that gives us 400. And so we've divided both sides by the diameter of the moon, and we've got 1 to 400 is the final answer. And that is uh, question 9 for 6 marks. Jolly good. Question 10. The diagram shows shape, uh, a shape made from triangle and a semicircle with diameter BC. Triangle ABC is right angled at B. I see a right angled triangle. I have a feeling I'll probably use Pythagoras' theorem here. A to B is 7.6 centimetres and A to C is 9.5 centimetres. Calculate the area of the shape. Correct the three significant figures. Well, yes, indeed, I'm going to use Pythagoras' theorem first to find the missing length of this triangle. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I rearrange and I substitute the numbers in. I type that into my calculator and I get b squared is 32.49 and I can square root and I get 5.7. b is 5.7 centimetres. Now I want to find the area of these two shapes combined. So I'm going to find the area of the triangle and the area of the semicircle using the formulas for area of the triangle and the semicircle. A semicircle is a triangle, a full circle divided by 2. So I'm just doing the pi r squared divided by 2. I substitute the numbers into the area of the triangle and I get the area of the triangle is 21.66 centimetres squared. And the semicircle has a radius of 2.85 centimetres. And so I substitute 2.85 into this expression to get this. And the area of the semicircle is 12.76 centimetres. Adding these two numbers together combines the two areas and I get a total area of 34.4 centimetres squared, and that is the final answer. And I indeed have rounded it to three significant figures. Question 11. Expand and simplify this triple bracket. x plus 5 times x minus 3 times x plus 3. So I'm going to copy it down, and I'm going to expand the last two brackets like this. I want to expand those brackets. I get x plus 5 times x squared minus 3x plus 3x minus 9. I multiply out the double bracket. I can now simplify it. The minus 3x and the plus 3x disappear, and now I've got another double bracket that I can expand. I multiply everything together, and when I multiply, I get x cubed minus 9x plus 5x squared minus 45. And that is the final answer. That is 3 marks in question 11. Question 12. Here are some points that Camelo scored in the last 11 basketball games. I want to find the interquartile range. And then at the bottom it says Kobe also plays basketball. The median number of points Kobe has scored in the last 11 games is 18.5. The interquartile range of Kobe's points is 10. Which of Camelo's or Kobe? is the most consistent points scorer. Give a reason for your answer. Okay, let's start with part A, and we're going to find the interquartile range. And the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite the list in order from smallest to biggest. I must do that to find the interquartile range. Now, the, there are 11 basketball games, 11 numbers in total. So the position of the lower quartile will be 11 plus 1 divided by 4, which is 12 divided by 4, which is 3. And the position of the upper quartile will be 11 plus 1 divided by 4 times 3, which is uh, 9. So this is the standard uh, expression you use to find the into, uh, position of the quartiles. So it's the third position and it's the ninth position. And I just count out the third position and the ninth position. 17 and 23, the interquartile range is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile which is 23 minus 17, which is 6. 
the interquartile range is 6. Now it says Colby also plays basketball and we're interested in comparing their statistics. Which one is the most consistent? And the word consistent here means the data is less spread out. Hence, the player with the lowest interquartile range is more consistent. And who has the lowest interquartile range? It is Carmelo. He has an interquartile range of 6, whereas Colby has 10. So you say Carmelo is more consistent because his scores have a smaller interquartile range. That's the final answer for full marks. Question 13. Find the equation of the line that passes through the points minus 3, 5 and 1, 2. Give your answer in the form ax plus by equals c, where a, b and c are integers. Okay, so this is straight line graphs. I'm going to start by finding the, uh, the value of the gradient between these two points. And so we're going to use m is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. I'm going to substitute the numbers in. So the second y coordinate is 2, the first y coordinate is uh, 5. The second x coordinate is 1, and the first x coordinate is minus 3. And we have to be very careful of the double negative here, because the, we're doing 1 minus minus 3, and it's going to be 1 plus 3. Tap into your calculator and you get a value for the gradient of minus 3 quarters. So the equation of line is y equals minus 3 quarters x plus c. To find the plus c now, I'm just going to substitute one of the coordinates in. So uh, I'm going to choose 1, 2, because it's the simplest coordinate. x is 1 and y is 2. Substituting x is 1, y is 2. And we get 2 equals minus 3 quarters times 1 plus c. The times by 1 can disappear. And we get 2 equals minus 3 quarters plus c. Add 3 quarters to both sides. 2 plus 3 quarters is c. So c is 11 quarters. So therefore the equation of line is y equals minus 3 quarters x plus 11 quarters. We can simplify this and make it in the form ax plus y, by equals c by times by 4 now. Move the minus 3x to the other side. And we get 3x plus 4y equals 11, and that is the final answer. We have found the equation of the straight line. Now part B, it says line L has the L1 has the equation y equals 3x plus 5, and L2 has the equation 6x plus 2x. 6y plus 2x equals 1. Show that L1 is perpendicular to L2. To do this, we're going to need to compare the gradients of the two lines, and so we need the second line to be in the form y equals mx plus c. The first line is already in that form. And so the first line has a gradient of 3, and the second, uh, just because the number in front of the x is 3, and the second one is 6y plus 2x equals 1, we'll rearrange that. We'll move the 2x to the other side, and we'll divide by 6, and we get y equals minus 2 6x plus 1 6. We have rearranged the expression to make it y equals mx plus c. And minus 2 sixths simplifies to be 1 third, so the gradient is minus 1 third. Now these two are perpendicular because the two gradients are negative reciprocals of each other. m equals 3 is a negative reciprocal of minus 1 third. Hence they are perpendicular. And we have shown it, we have scored all six marks to question 13. Question 14, the histogram shows information about the height of some tomato plants. 26 plants have a height of less than 20 centimetres. Work out the number of plants, the total number of plants. Okay, and this is a tricky question because we're not given a scale for the frequency density, and so we're going to have to work backwards to find the scale, and then forwards to find the total number of plants. Okay, so 26 plants have a height less than 20 centimetres, and we know that that must be this bar here, because from 0 to 20, is the uh, there are 26 plants. And the area of the bar in a histogram gives you the frequency. And so we're going to draw an X at the top of this bar, where the missing scale is, 
and we're going to find what x is uh, using the fact that the area is 26. So it's the width of the bar is 20, the height of the bar is x, so 20x equals 26. Divide by 20 and we get x is 1.3. So therefore we can fill in the uh, scale here. If we know that 1.3 is there, we can figure out that the rest of the scale is going up in 0.5s. Now we know that scale, and we've done the hard part, now we can find the areas of each bar. And the first green bar has an area of 26, we already know that. The next blue bar has a width of 5, of 10 sorry, it's got a width of 10, and a height of 3.6, goes all the way up to 3.6. The orange bar has a width of 10, and a height of 3.3, uh, just looking off the scale here to see where the orange bar goes up to. And then the purple bar has a width of 30 and a height of 1. And so multiplying those, we get 36, 33, and 30. And therefore, the total is adding all of these together, which is 125. There are 125 plants, and that is the final answer. Question 15, it says, a rectangular lawn of length 3x metres and a width of 2x uh, metres uh, is in a diagram. The lawn has a path of width 1 metre on all three sides, as shown in the diagram. The total area of the lawn and the path is 100 metres cubed. Show that 6x squared plus 7x minus 98 is 100. And from that, calculate the area of the lawn. Show your algebraic working. OK, so we, want, we know that the total area of the lawn and the path is uh, 100. So let's find an expression for that. OK, so we know that the width of the lawn is 3x and the height is 2x. Therefore, the entire width of the path and the lawn is 3x plus 2, which is 3x plus 1 plus 1. And the height of the uh, lawn and the path is 2x plus 1. OK, so now we have expressions for the width and the height of the lawn and the path. And we know the entire area of the lawn and the path is 100. So we're just going to multiply the width and the height together to get 100. And we'll expand that bracket uh, using double brackets. We get three, uh, 6x squared plus 3x plus 4x plus 2 equals 100. We simplify that to so get 6x squared plus 7x plus 2 equals 100. And we take 100 off both sides. And we get 6x squared plus 7x minus 98 equals 0, as required. That's what we wanted to show. Now, part B, uh, we're going to find the L area of the lawn. I'm going to show clear algebraic working. And to do that, because it's asking us to show clear algebraic working, we're going to use the quadratic formula in full. I'm going to write our working out for the quadratic formula. So we know that a is 6, b is 7, and c is minus 98. And we just substitute those numbers into the quadratic formula, like this. Just FYI, the quadratic formula is given to you in the exam booklet, so you can just copy it from the front of the exam. We get that x is either 3.5 or minus 4.767, but 4, minus 4.67 doesn't make sense in this context because it's a negative number. So we can get rid of that, and we know the, uh, the x must be 3.5, and the area of the lawn must be 3x times 2x, which is 6x squared. Let me substitute that in. 6 times 3.5 squared is 73.5 centimetres squared, and that is the final answer. That is the area of the lawn. That's question 15 for 5 marks. We are doing really well. Let's keep going and persevere all the way through this test. We are making really good progress. Okay, question 16, and we have a really nice circle theorems question for you here. It says A, B, C, and D are points in the circle. P, A is a tangent to the circle. Angle P, A, D is uh, 39 degrees, and angle B, C, D is 103 degrees. We're asked to calculate the angle A, D, B, 
and we ask to give a reason for each stage of our working. This is really essential in circle theorems questions that you give a reason. Write down why you know each angle is what it is. So straight away I can see the alternate segment theorem here. I think we're going to use that. I can see a tangent touching a triangle inside the circle and that's alternate segment theorem. And we've also got the cyclic quadrilateral theorem here. I can definitely see a cyclic quadrilateral in this shape. And we're asked to find ADB, which is this angle here. And I'm just labeling ADB before we start. So using the uh, alternate segment theorem, I know that 39 and 39 are the same. So ABD is equal to 39 degrees because of the alternate segment theorem. I'm writing that down straight away. And I also know that uh, angle DAB is 180 minus 103 degrees, which is 77 degrees. And I can write that angle DAB is 77 degrees because opposite angles in a cyclic quadrilateral sum to 180 degrees. And so I've memorized the circle theorems here and I'm writing a reason uh, for my working out in full sentences. Finally, I can see this triangle here, and this is a triangle where I know two angles already, and I want to find the third angle, so I'm just going to subtract from 180. I'm going to do 180 minus 77 minus 39 degrees is uh, 64 degrees, and 64 degrees is the final answer. We have done it. And that's uh, question 16 for five marks. Now, let's move on to question 17, and here we have a bounds question y equals 2a divided by b minus c. And I've got a is 42 corrected to two significant figures, b is 24 corrected to two significant figures, and c is 14 corrected to two significant figures. Work out a lower bound for the value of y. So we're trying to find the lower bound. Give your answer corrected to two significant figures. Show you're working out clearly. And so we're going to start by writing out the possible bounds on a, b, and c. So the smallest value A could be is 41.5, and the biggest value A could be is 42.5. This is bounds. If you're not familiar with where I'm getting these numbers from, go watch my video on bounds. I will link it in the description below. And A, B, and C are bounded like this. I always start by writing the inequalities for bounds before I continue. Now we've got the equation y equals 2a divided by b minus c. I'm going to focus on this equation here. And we're asked to find the lower bound for y. So we want y to be small. And to do that, we need the, uh, the fraction to be small. And to get a fraction small, we want the top to be small and the bottom to be big. So to get a small number as a fraction, you want a big number, sorry, a small number divided by a big number. A small number on top, big number on the bottom. But on the bottom, we've got b minus c. And to get a big number when we're doing b minus c, we want a big b divided by a minus a small c. This is how we get a big number on the bottom. OK, so now we know uh, the, we want a small a, a big b, and a small c. And we can start substituting those numbers in. So a small a is 41.5. A big b is 24.5 and a small c is 13.5. Okay, we substitute those numbers in, we type it into a calculator, we get 7.5454, but we want it to two significant figures, so we're just gonna get 7.5. And that is the final answer. We have found the lower bound for y for three marks. Now question 18, we've got a nasty algebraic expression here, and we're going to try and simplify it. It says, show that 3 minus x minus 1 divided by x squared minus 1 over 3x plus 2 can be written as a over x plus b, where a and b are integers. Okay, so this is a lot of algebra, and we're going to be very, very careful when we're doing this. If you make a small mistake, it's going to throw everything off. So we're going to uh, copy down the expression, and I can see a dividing of fractions here. And so I'm going to do keep, change, flip. And when I do this, I get 3 minus x minus 1 times 3x plus 2 over x squared minus 1. And I can rewrite this. I can expand the, um, sorry, factorise 
the bottom of that fraction, x squared minus 1, is a difference of two squares. It's x minus 1 times x plus 1. So I've factorised x squared minus 1. I can now write this as one fraction. So we've got x minus 1 times that fraction, and we can just put the x minus 1 on the top. And from there, I can see that I can simplify that fraction, divide by x minus 1, x minus 1, and we'll get left with 3 minus 3x plus 2 over x plus 1. We are getting a lot closer. Now we need to subtract these two fractions, and to do that, we'll need a common denominator. And just see that 3 is the same as 3 times x plus 1 over x plus 1. So I've just written 3 with a common denominator of x plus 1. And I can do that because I've got an x plus 1 on top, an x plus 1 on the bottom, and they will cancel out, but I don't want them to cancel. I want to leave it as a fraction like that. And so this entire, uh, these two fractions can be subtracted, and we're left with this, where we're subtracting the two numerators, and then we expand. And we are subtracting everything, the, subtracting the 3x and subtracting the plot positive 2. And that simplifies 3x minus 3x is 1. And uh, sorry, 3x minus 3x disappears, 3 minus 2 is 1. So we're left with a 1 on top, and on the bottom we've got an x plus 1. And that is how the question asks for it, and we have simplified it as required. That is question 18 for 4 marks. That's some very nasty algebra, that's some really good practice for you. You might want to pause the video now and so you can do that entire question yourself from memory, because that will really help you practice your algebra. If there's a step you don't like, you might want to rewind that question. Let's keep going though, let's do question 19, and here we've got a diagram of a solid cone. The base of the cone is a horizontal circle with a centre O, and it's got a radius of 4.5 centimetres. AB is the diameter of the base, and OV is the vertical height of the cone. The curved surface area is 130 centimetres squared, and we're asked to calculate the size of angle AVB. Give your answer to one decimal place. And to find AVB, I'm just going to highlight that right now. That's the angle between A, V, and B, and I've labelled that in green on the diagram. Now we are given the curved surface area of a cone, and for this, it's a good idea to look at the formula booklet. The curved surface area of a cone is given by pi r l, where r is the radius of the cone, and l is the slanted height of the uh, slanted length of the cone. And what we can do is we can substitute the radius, which is 4.5, and the curved surface area of 130 into this expression, like this, substituting those numbers in, like this, and we can solve for L by dividing by pi times 4.5, like this. And when we type that into the calculator, we get length is 9.1956 centimetres. So the length of the slanted length of the cone is 9.19 centimetres. Right, we are making a really good progress here. Now I can see a triangle here, and I know the bottom of this triangle uh, is... 9 centimetres because that's twice the um, radius of the cone. And we know it's also an isosceles triangle. Uh, these two lengths are the same because both of those lengths are the length of the cone. So let's focus on that triangle. I'm just going to copy that down and I can see that it's isosceles so I can half that triangle. And I've got a right angle triangle here which I can do Sakatoa on. I can do inverse sine of opposite over adjacent to find the angle. We are given the opposite, we're given the, sorry, we're given the hypotenuse. I should have said hypotenuse there. I should shoot the numbers in, and I do inverse sine on my calculator, and I get that the angle is 29.298819 degrees. I times by two, and I get the angle is 58.6 degrees. The angle AVB is 58.8, 58.6 degrees, and that's for four marks, and I've got the final answer. Only a few questions left. Let's keep going. Let's get to the end. Question 20 is about uh, graph transformations, and it says the diagram shows part of the curve y equals f of x, and the coordinates of the maximum point are 3, 5. 
you write down the coordinates of the maximum point of the curve with the equation. y equals f of x plus 3, y equals 2f of x, and y equals f of 3x. Okay, so y equals f of x plus 3, that is a horizontal translation by 3 units to the left. So it's inside the brackets, it's going to be going more negative. And so this will look like this. It will move 3 units to the left. And the new maximum point will be 0, 5. Because the x coordinate has moved 3 units, 3 minus 3 is 0. Next one, we're going to multiply everything by 2. And, well, sorry, only the y coordinate by 2. It's going to be a vertical uh, enlargement by scale factor 2. And so it's going to be twice as tall. The new uh, maximum will be 310. We've multiplied the y coordinate by 2. Next, we've got y equals f of 3x. And this is a horizontal stretch by scale factor 1 third. We are multiplying the x coordinates by a third. And the third of 3 is 1. So the new coordinate will be 1, 5. In your exam, you only have to write the coordinates, you don't have to sketch the graph. Um, I've just animated it in this video, so it's a bit easier to understand. Now part B, it says the curve with the equation y equals f of x is transformed to give the uh, curve y equals f of x minus 4. Describe this transformation. And this is simply a vertical translation by a vector 0 minus 4. Looks like this. And it moves down four spaces. So it's a translation by vector 0 minus 4. The minus 4 must go on the bottom because that refers to the vertical translation. Excellent. That's question 20 for four marks. Question 21. The curve with the equation y equals 8x squared plus 2 over x has one stationary point. Find the coordinates of this stationary point and show your workings clearly. So to find stationary points, we have to find the gradient uh, when the gradient is equal to zero. So that's the key idea of stationary points, the gradient is equal to zero. So let's differentiate it and make it the derivative equal to zero. So y equals 8x squared plus 2 over x. That's the same as 8x squared plus 2x to the power minus 1. I must, I must, must, must rewrite 2 over x as a power of x first. I differentiate it now, and when I differentiate this, I get 16x minus 2x to the power minus 2. I've differentiated that, and I'm going to make that equal to 0. To solve this e equation, I need to rewrite the 2 over uh, 2x to the power minus 2 as 2 over x squared. And now I can rearrange and solve. I can move the uh, 2 minus x squared to the other side. 16x equals 2 over x squared. Multiply by x squared, I get 16x cubed equals 2. Divide by 16, I get 1 eighth. x cubed equals 1 eighth. And I can cube root that to get that x is 1 half or 0 0.5. I found the x coordinate. I'm getting really close. All I have to do to find the y coordinate is substitute it into the original equation. The original equation not the differentiated, the original. And I put x is 0 0.5 into this, type it into my calculator, and I get that y is 6. The, equi uh, the y coordinate is 6, so the coordinate of the uh, minimum stationary point is 0, uh, 0 0.5, 6. And it's a final answer, and I've scored 5 marks for that. That is a tricky differentiation question. If you're not familiar with differentiation, um, you should watch my videos on differentiation and go into far more detail on that. Now, question 22. It says A, B, C, D is a trapezium. A to B is parallel to D to C. A to B is 12A. A to D is 3B. And D to C is 18A. E is a point on DB such that D to E, is, so e to B is 1 to 2. Show by a vector method that BC is parallel to AE. Okay, to show the parallel, we're going to find an expression for B to C and A to E. We'll start by finding the, uh, the 
expression for B to C, I'm going to follow this path here from B to C, and that's going to minus 12A plus 3B plus 18A. I'm going to copy that down, minus 12A plus 3B plus 18A. Just remember that 12A is going backwards, so it's negative. I will simplify that to get 6A plus 3B. Now we're going from A to E, and we have to see that this ratio tells us it's in the ratio 1 to 2. So that's three separate parts, one bit and two bits, three parts, and so it's split into thirds. And that one, that share of one tells us it's a uh, one third of the way. So D to E is a third of D to B. So if we go from A to E, we've got uh, 3B plus a third of DB, and D to B is this, tw uh, 12A minus DB. It's 12A across and minus DB up. We can simplify that, we can multiply that by a third, and we get 3B plus 4A minus B, like that, which simplifies to be 4A plus 2B. We are really close. We've got an expression for BC and an expression for AE. To show the parallel now, we have to show the multiples of each other. And so what I'll do is I'll factorise and I'll see that B to C is 3 times 2A plus B and A to E is 2 times 2A plus B. They are both multiples of 2A plus B and hence they are both parallel. They are both parallel to 2A plus B as required and we've got the final answer. Five marks for question 22. Okay, question 23, the very final question in the test. The fourth term of an arithmetic series is 17, and the tenth term of the arithmetic series is 35. Find the sum of the first 50 terms of the arithmetic series. Okay, so we're going to start by just copying out the formula for the sum of an arithmetic series. We're going to have to find the sum, so we're going to need this formula. Then what I like to do is like to write out some spaces to show me the terms of the arithmetic series. And I can see that the fourth term is 17 and the last, the 10th term is 35. So that's what I'm using spaces for so I can visualize and see where each term goes. And to get to from 17 to 35, I'm going to have to add the difference, add the same number six times, because I'm going up six Ds. And so we've got, therefore, 17 plus 60 is 35. Or 35 minus 17 is 60. That's 18 is equal to 60. And therefore, D is 3. 3 is the number that must be the diff common difference in this arithmetic series, because that's the only way to get from 17 to 35, by adding 6 numbers. 6 are the same number. I can also find the first number in this series. I've got 17... And to go backwards to the first number, I subtract 3D. So 17 minus 3D is going to be the original number. And D is 3, so 17, 17 minus 9 is 8. The first number of this arithmetic series is 8. A is 8 and D is 3. So the sum is the number of terms divided by 2. Uh, times 2 times a plus n minus 1 times d. I'll just put those numbers in where a is 8, n is 50, and d is 3. And I type into my calculator, and I get 4,075 is the final answer. That is the final answer for 5 marks. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have completed this paper. Well done for concentrating this long. I know it was a long video. If there's any question you didn't like, you might want to uh, rewind and rewatch that part of the video, or you can watch my videos on those specific topics, which I will uh, link in the description below. Thank you for watching this week's video from Advanced Maths. Please like and subscribe to support the channel. It really helps. And it's also really helpful if you share the video with your classmates as well, so they can revise uh, with Advanced Maths. Check out advancedmaths.com for more resources to help you pass your GCSEs and get your target grade. Thanks for watching and good luck in your exams.